but as you open your Bible, let me just kind of catch us up. When we last met in the book of Acts, we started Paul's third missionary journey, and it kind of was a nondescript, uh, inauspicious beginning to the third missionary journey in verse 23 of Acts chapter 18. And as Paul began to work his way from the east to the west through what we know as Turkey today, he went through two regions. Those regions were called Phrygia and Galatia. What's significant about the fact that he went through those regions is the way that he was treated in those regions in Acts chapter 14. He was beaten severely. Uh, he was imprisoned. Uh, he was just heavily persecuted. And now he's going back through the very same area because he's interested in people. He wants to minister to people. 1,500 miles overland in a mountainous area. You know what Turkey's like today, right? 1,500 miles overland in a very mountainous area and he's coming down out of the mountains uh, in the passage and he happens upon some men, 12 men. And these men are like the man who is called Apollos. And Apollos was our focus in that last sermon. He was mighty in the scriptures, but he was humble in the spirit. That's a great combination. It's hard to find people that are really, really talented and charismatic, but also have the humility to depend upon the grace of God. That is a rare combination. And yet Apollos was that man. Well, Paul's coming out of the mountains. He happens upon these 12 men. And he asks them if they have received the Holy Spirit. And these men respond and say, you know, we, we don't even know if there, there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> and yet these men are believers, right? Uh, they are men that have identified with the baptism of John, but they haven't been taught, just like Apollos hadn't been taught. And so Paul teaches them. He takes some time to teach them. I'm sure that some of the things that Paul said to them are the very same things that he said to people in Acts chapter 13, like showing people from three different psalms how Christ had to be resurrected from the dead. And so when he did that, then these people finally understood they were baptized, they received the Holy Spirit, and they were able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now as we work our way then through Acts chapter 19, we have shifted back from a concentration on Paul or on Apollos to Paul again. And so that's where we pick up the scene in our text today. Look with me at Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. It says, Now God worked, and I, God worked rather unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. Also many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the Lord, the word rather of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. I was thinking about this text and, and one thought that occurred to me that's the overarching thought for this text is that good ministry, as far as it's defined by the word of God, good ministry is delivering to 
to people what they need and not necessarily what they want. You know, think about that statement for a minute. It's delivering to people what they need and not necessarily what they want. For example, I could have got up here and probably riveted your attention with a story that had nothing to do with the text, but it, it would have been a tearjerker even. could have been something about Thanksgiving and everybody would be crying and it'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? It'd be giving people what they want, but it wouldn't be giving people what they need, would it? Because stories aren't going to transform our lives. The only thing that can really transform our lives are what we find in the Scripture. You say, is it wrong to tell a story? No, it's not wrong. I mean, I, I can tell you a story to illustrate truth in the Word of God, but, but the story has no power in it. The Word of God has the power. Good ministry gives people what they need and not what they want. Now, with that said, here I am proclaiming forcefully God's truth to you. I had to prepare in order to do that. You say, yeah, you study. But that's not all that I did. I, I prayed. I poured my heart out to God and I asked him to give me a message for you. Do you think that God wants you to prepare for this moment each week? And I would say to you that he does. He wants you to pray for me or whoever is preaching. He wants you to pray for your family. He wants you to pray for people as they're hearing the word of God. Not that it would just fall dead upon hard ground, but that it would fall upon fertile hearts so that it would germinate and begin to flourish and grow mightily as we get to the end of the passage. That's the whole objective. Good ministry is delivering to people what they need and not what they want. Look at verses 11 and 12 in the text. Notice who's working here. Who is working? Who is working? God. God worked by the hands of Paul and people were liberated from sickness and demon possession. Who was working again? God was working. And you say, well, let's focus on Paul. How wonderful he is. Let's focus on these handkerchiefs and aprons. That would be a good idea. Why don't you preach a message on handkerchiefs and aprons? That's not the focus of the text. And Paul is not the focus of the text. And, and dispossessing people of demons is not the focus of the text. God is the focus of the text. And God working, that's what we should be looking at as we uh, unwrap this text before us. You say, well, people were sick and they were healed. And, and people were ravaged by demons and they were dispossessed of those demons. But we might get the idea that that's what ministry is about, right? We might get the idea that ministry is about men like Paul. They're really godly. We put them up here, and that's what ministry is about. You know, and so the focus is on Paul. You might get the idea that I had to focus on the pastor. Well, if you focus on me, and you focus long enough, you're going to find some pretty terrible things, because I'm just a man. As a matter of fact, I wake up, look in the morning, look in the mirror in the morning, and, and I see some terrible things. All right? I see a troll that just emerged from the blankets. And, uh, and it's not a pretty sight. And, and so I take the time to comb my hair right, and to brush my teeth. But it's not just the external. I wake up as a troll. You say, what are you talking about? I, I wake up in the flesh. That's, that's something that happens every morning. I have to purposely say... Lord, I don't want to live like this today. I want to live by depending upon your spirit to do the work of ministry. And you know, there are always people that will come along. There are always situations that will come along and provoke me back to my troll-like status. But I have to overcome that through the power of God's Holy Spirit and minister to people anyway. Now, that's ministry. That's what we should be focusing on. You say, well, why shouldn't we focus on handkerchiefs and aprons? Because if we do, then we're going to not be, we're, we're going to, we're going to actually have people that are going to come along and they're going to imitate, you, you know, true ministry by using handkerchiefs and aprons. If you don't believe that, just watch some TV with these televangelists on them. They use handkerchiefs and aprons. Look at verse 13. Wandering Jewish exorcists. <laughs> Televangelist preachers, all right? Uh, wandering Jewish exorcists sought to imitate good ministry. That's what we see here. 
Uh, they sought to do only what God can do. Uh, the, the, you know, God worked it through Paul. He confirmed apostolic ministry, but it was all about God. It wasn't all about Paul. And so these men were using the name of Jesus. They took upon uh, themselves this power that they thought that they had now because they could wield Jesus. It's, uh, I'm going to wave the name of Jesus over you. That's the idea. It's a magic wand. It's a talisman. It's a rabbit's foot. I pull it out of my pocket when I need it. And, and we've got these magic books, and, and we'll just add Jesus to our magic books. Do you see that? You say, who are these men? Well, the Bible tells us that seven of these men were the sons of Sceva, who was a, a chief priest. You say, I, I don't ever re remember reading about a man named Sceva who was a chief priest in, in, in Jerusalem. And you know what? I, I never have read of him either. You suppose maybe these men were not priests at all? You suppose maybe these men were not really men that were trusting in Christ at all? But they said that they did? Well, that, that certainly would be a wise assumption when you read the rest of the text. And yet, they might as well be druids, whoever they are. Because here they are, using the name of Jesus to command demons. You say, well, what does this have to do with us? I mean, I'm not doing that today. Well, it's how many Christians live today. We live like the sons of Sceva. You say, what are you talking about? We attempt ministry apart from truly trusting in the person and work of Christ. We go out there bare naked and humiliated and beaten. <laughs> you say, really? Yeah, really. We're not clothed with humility, but with self-righteousness. We're not tempered in the things that we say we just let it all come out and we blame it on our personality and yet we should all have the mind of Christ we should all have tenderness and compassion for people we should be moved by the spirit of God have, have you looked at, at verse 15 I mean these men were not obedient to the faith they're simply looking for power. That's what you see in many churches that dot the landscape of, uh, escape of, of the United States of America today. And, and these are people that are giving people what they want and not what they need. Most churches in America are that way today. You see, how can you say that? Well, because I've listened to people that have come to our church that have been in those churches that are all over the place. Those churches give people what they want but not what they need. You know, and one thing about this, giving people what they need takes time. Sometimes people will say to me, why aren't we growing faster? And I'm thinking in my mind, I'm glad we're not growing faster. I've got enough work to do. You say, well, what do you mean? Don't you want more people in the church? To be honest with you, not really. You say, well, why? Because we don't have enough people to take care of the people that are here. Why would I want more people to come here to be neglected? Really? I mean, isn't that true? I want people to take time to disciple people. And then once we have a core of people that are disciple makers, then let other people come. That's how we should grow. <laughs> All right? But the problem is we, we, we want the numbers because we're like the seven sons of Sceva. If you got a big crowd, then it's wonderful. Do you know that there is a problem when a church grows too quickly? They don't have a core. They have all of these problems. They're like Corinth, you know. They have all of these problems, but they only have like two or three people that are capable of dealing with them. Well, how are you going to deal with a large multitude of people if there's just two or three that are spiritually mature and godly? You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to have uh, the strength to be able to reach everyone. How many Bible studies do you think you can have a week? And really invest your life in a person. And now ask yourself this question, how many do I have? Then gauge the spiritual maturity of our church. Because I think that that's the key here. I think that's why verse 15 is chilling. When the evil spirit answers this command in an unexpected way from the seven sons of Sceva, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? That is haunting. 
The Spirit knew Jesus. The Spirit knew Paul. He didn't know the sons of Sceva. Listen, when you're looking at the spiritual realm, you see these demons and, and, and they say that they knew Jesus and they knew Paul. Do you realize that the English word for know in verse 15, it appears twice, doesn't it? But the Greek word is different each time. When the demon says that they that he, rather, knew Jesus, it's different from the way that he knew Paul. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, the Bible's clear. He knew Jesus in an experiential way. You say, well, give me an example of that. When Jesus walked the earth, he came among two demon-possessed men. Mark only speaks of one of them, but there are two, according to Matthew chapter 8. And these, these men were demoniacs of Gadara. And they are wandering through a, a cemetery, and they are maddened. They are possessed with demons. And Jesus happens upon them, and the Bible tells us that the demons speak to Jesus directly. Do you remember what they say to him? They say to him, what have we to do with you, thou Jesus? Ha have you come to torment us before our time? Do you realize that the demons knew that their time was short? And that Jesus had complete authority over them? That's what that text teaches us. Have you come here to torment us before our time? The demon in, in our text here in Acts chapter uh, 19, they, they know Jesus. They know who he is. They know what he's capable of. They know his power and his authority. They know it by experience. Then they say, and Paul, Paul, I know him too. You say, well, what, what, did he, what did he mean when he said he knew Paul? The word for know there is he knew Paul in a, in a factual, objective way. Not in a bad way, but he knew Paul in the sense that, yeah, this is the Apostle Paul, the power of God is on him, I know that. I know that about Paul. Now, that's a little bit different than the way that they knew Jesus. Yeah, I know Paul, but I, but, but I don't know you. Who are you? That's scary. And so, what happens in, in the text? The demon's uh, predictable result really follows. The evil spirit leaped upon them, it says, overpowered them, prevailed them there in verse 16, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Seven against one. Seven sons of Sceva against one demon. And he beat them up. And he tore their fake robes off of them. And they left the house bruised, battered, and bloodied. They left the house naked and humiliated. Can you imagine what that was like? Do you think that got around Ephesus? Well, I think so. I think it went around Ephesus like wildfire. People understood what was happening. And, and so uh, they, it got around to people. Uh, but you look at this and you say, that's a very terrifying thing. You think that people would be afraid of demonic activity now, but but notice that who who is magnified after this? What does the text say? It's Jesus who is magnified, not the demons. We would write a book about this, and 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 we would call it red or white or piercing the darkness. And we would tell about all the demonic activity that's going on all around us. As a matter of fact, down in Ephesus, this demon came and he really beat up these guys and tore their clothes off. The focus would be on demons, not on God. That is a big mistake. And so that's exactly what's happening here. The idea, I think, is, look, God and his word needs to be lifted up. The Lord Jesus Christ needs to be lifted up in, in, in a church and not the demonic activity that we see happening. And by the way, God and his name and the Lord Jesus is magnified, 
But still there are people that will take the word of God and manipulate it and use it just the way the sons of Sceva did. And sometimes they are pastors. They take the word of God and they use it as a tool of manipulation in the lives of people. And instead of allowing the word of God to kind of preach itself, I know that sounds strange, I'm not just reading the Bible to you, am I? But I am going through a passage. And my thoughts are stirred by the passage and I am relaying to you as accurately as I can the text. So what am I doing when I preach the word of God? I'm trying to remove myself as much as possible and allow the word of God to do the heavy lifting. That's what we need in church. But you say, well, people don't want that. They won't come. That You won't gather a crowd that way. Just ask the church growth experts. I don't care what they say. I care about the word of God. And being faithful to the word of God, because in the end, if the cancer gets me and I die in a few years, or, or if I get hit by a car and my life suddenly ends, you know what the only thing that's going to matter when I stand before Jesus? The only thing that's going to matter to me is, I'm thankful for you. Because you are faithful to my word. And that's all that I care about. You say, but do you care about me? I care about you. I do. But I care about you enough to give you the word of God. Right? It's the word of God that will do the work in the lives of people. I think it's time that we start to get serious about ministry and stop listening to all these voices that are around us about success. Success is a bad thing in many ways. It's a syndrome. It's a plague. What we need is to be faithful to the word of God. We need to be faithful to God himself. We need to have a true relationship with God. That's what we need. There are no limits to what God will work in and through you if you are depending upon him to do the work of ministry. You look at verse 18, and, and these men, it, it tells us that many came uh, because of the earnest testimony of the word of God and the power of God resting upon them. And, and what did they do as a result of coming to Christ? They burned their magic books. Because, you know, for them, those magic books were a way of life. It, it's what they were depending upon. You say, what's the point of telling us that? They're trying to tell us that, look, they burned all bridges back to the sons of Sceva and their philosophy of ministry and the way that they lived their lives. They burned bridges. We need more people like that. We need a true movement to Christ. And by the way, if we start to see people turning to Christ in large numbers here, do you know what's going to happen? People are going to burn their books. You say, well, what do you mean? I don't think a culture that is saturated with Christ would ever tolerate evil literature. So we won't have Christian men that are uh, hunting through pornography at night on their computer. We won't, we won't have uh, Christian people allowing their children to read books that are preoccupied with witchcraft in the netherworld. We'll have an earnest turning to truth and people that have a desire to be saturated with truth. You say, well, what about other areas of life? Well, it's in all areas, even the, the television programs that we watch. I mean, you should know if you're a Christian who has the Holy Spirit residing in you whether or not you should watch a certain show. I shouldn't have to stand up here and say to you, don't go to this movie, don't go to that movie, and don't watch that television show. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. You should know better. But do you know what happens? We grieve the Holy Spirit, and we really want to watch it, so we overlook the fact that they say God, damn, and it several times throughout the movie, because after all, there are some redeeming characteristics of the movie. Never mind they profane the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay. We've got to change that mindset. We've got to change that attitude. But I can't change it in you. I'll let the Holy Spirit deal with you. Holy Spirit needs to deal with me. But I'll tell you what, there will be a change. There will be a change in the music you listen to. You say, what are you talking about? Music's not evil, is it? Well, is music the only realm in the whole wide world that can't be good and bad? Do you know why Christians say that music itself is neither good nor evil because they have to say that in order to listen to the sensual godless music that they're listening to you say well start naming it off 
Well, again, you should know. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, you should know that there is certain music that will deaden your spiritual life. And you should seek to get it out of your life. That's what was happening here. These people had genuine repentance going on. And because of that, the Word of God, look at verse 20, the Word of God grew mightily and prevailed. I would say that that's worth far more than the treasure of 10,000 worlds. Wouldn't you? I want the Word of God to grow mightily and to prevail in this church and in this community and throughout the world. Now before I leave this text and, and make some application today, I want to just take a purposeful aside and talk about demonic activity because I think it's important. If you're interested in finding out more about Satan and how he works in the lives of Christians, I would encourage you to go on our sermon audio account. If you go to sermonaudio.com and look up our church, you can download a sermon that I preached back in May of this year. And that sermon is titled, Know Your Enemy. And it's all about the devil. But it's from the Bible. That's the difference. I want to talk to you about demon possession because that's what's happening in this text. What does it mean to be possessed by a demon? Do you know? It means that a demon takes direct control over the person's life. Or, or it could even be more than one demon. It could be several demons. They take direct control over a person's life by residing within that person and controlling them. That's what demon possession is, according to the scripture. Now here's the next question. Who is possessed by demons? That's a little tricky to answer. Uh, all people, whether they are Christian or not, are affected by demonic activity. You might as well be very clear about that. <laughs> you say, well, what do you mean? Even Christians? Yes, Christians can be uh, oppressed by demonic activity. If you don't believe that, look at the life of Job. Look at the way that Paul was attacked by Satan. I mean, Satan can affect us physically, emotionally, and spiritually according to the scripture. And so there can be demonic oppression for a Christian. Do you think that a Christian can be possessed by a demon? And I would say to you, no. You say, but can affect us deleteriously, right? Yes. Well, how do we avoid that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have one verse for you to jot down. It would be 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Now, there are other verses, but this one is really, really important. Also in verse 9. The Bible tells us how to deal with demonic activity if it is present in our lives as believers. You say, well, how? Be sober, be vigilant. Those are the two things. Be very serious-minded when it comes to demonic activity and be watching out for it. Those are the first two things. And then the scripture goes on and tells us to resist the devil in all demonic activity, by the way. It's not like the devil can be personally involved in all of our lives. He is just one being, after all. But he has a vast network of demons. So when the Bible says resist the devil, it's telling us to resist him and all demonic activity. Resist it. How? Goes on. Tells us. Resist him steadfast in the faith. You say, well, how do I remain steadfast in the faith? Glad you asked. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be renewed in your mind daily. How do I do that? Feed your mind with the word of God. Allow the Word of God to saturate your thoughts and be prayerfully dependent upon God. And when you have those thoughts that are not right, you will have the ability to bring those thoughts into captivity and then to the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. We need to meditate on things that are true, things that are real. That's what the word true means in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. We need to meditate on noble, just, lovely, and pure things. The praiseworthy and, and the things that are, are good, are of good report, those are the things that we need to be thinking deeply about. But too often we're thinking about handkerchiefs and aprons. Are you following me? And so, 
I would caution you before we leave this subject in two ways. Don't become preoccupied with demons. Become preoccupied with Christ. Don't go out and read all of the literature today that is out there, even the so-called Christian literature that is preoccupied with demons and not preoccupied with Christ. If you want to know about demons, if you want to know about the devil, go to the Bible. Find a topical Bible and read about them. And then I would caution you to against the absurdity that's out there that all sickness, all sin, all emotional problems, all people who are mentally retarded are demonically possessed. People actually believe that. You know, that's not true. Not everyone is demonically uh, possessed. And by the way, here's something else that you need to be very clear about. You don't need help to sin. You say, well, the devil made me do it. Uh, we're always looking for someone that made us do it. But we don't need any help, thank you very much. What we need is transformation that takes place from the inside out. And that can only happen as we relate rightly with God. Now, how, how, do, we, how do we understand what it is in our ministry to give people what they need? Well, we see it exemplified in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? When the Lord walked on this earth, he did so with authority that commanded even unclean spirits to obey him in Mark chapter 1 and verse 27. And he endured the onslaught of temptation not only in Matthew chapter 4 when uh, he was thrust out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted of the devil, but also don't forget about the Garden of Gethsemane uh, where he was facing a very difficult time and and he, he recognized that his soul was troubled. And as he thought about asking his father to let this cup pass from him, and in another place in the Gospel of John, he say, he's saying, oh, let this hour, uh, Lord, save me from this hour. Um, he recognized that it was for that very purpose, for that very hour that he came. And he came to drain the cup of God's judgment for us. By the way, that's what salvation is all about. And do you know that John 16 and verse 11 tells us that in that very hour, sin and the devil were judged and Jesus had the victory? You don't gain victory over Satan. Jesus fought and gained the victory for you. You can't grab Satan by the tail and command him. That's exactly what the sons of Sceva did. You say, how in the world can, can I know for sure that I'm a child of God and not a child of the devil? Because there are only two types of children in the devil, or in the world, rather. Children of the devil, children of God. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. You say, how can I know for sure that I'm in the kingdom of light, that I'm a child of God? I'm going to tell you. Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for you, that you might have the righteousness of God in him. There was an exchange made for you. All of these works that you think are going to be acceptable to God, they are rife with sin. You think that your heritage, you think that belonging to a Baptist church or a Catholic church or a Pentecostal church, you think that you belong to a certain tradition, you think that uh, just because you're a kind person, whatever it is, all of these things that are seemingly good things, you say, well, I'll offer them up to God one day and he'll receive them. Well, if you think that way, you're calling God a liar because he has said, no, no, there is only one way to my son. There is only one way to me, rather, and that's through my son. You have to turn your back and change your mind about those seemingly good things that you do in life, and you need to put your trust and your faith in the finished work of Christ. Jesus died and was buried and rose again and he did all of that for you. That's the great exchange. You say, how do I know for sure that I've done that? I have a son that just asked me over and over again, but how can I know for sure? I, I, I can't know this for sure. Um, how do I do it? How do I do it? And, and really what's going on in my son is, I don't want to do it. 
I don't want to know Christ. And, 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 the, and the key here is that we need to pray that God would work in the hearts of people so that they would recognize that they are in the kingdom of darkness and they need to leave it behind for the kingdom of light and they need to cling to the garment of Christ and trust in him alone for eternal life. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And there is no other way. You say, it sounds too simple. No, you, you want it to be complicated because people want what they want. But I'm giving you what you need. You see what I mean? This is exemplified in the ministry of Christ. It's energized by the gospel ministry. Do you remember when, when Jesus sent out the 70? Do you remember that? And they all, they all came back and... And, and ministry was worked through them and they were really, really excited. They were like little children and they said, Oh, Lord Jesus, look at what was done. How, how, how we were able to cast out demons in your name and to heal people in your name. They were excited. And do you know what Jesus said? He smiled and he said, Well, fellas, guess what? One day I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Silence. That's pretty big, isn't it? And, and then he said, look, fellas, it's good that you're excited. But don't rejoice in the fact that you have authority from me to cast out demons and to heal people. But rather rejoice in what? What, they, what should they rejoice in according to Luke chapter 10 and verse 20? Do you know? That their names are written in heaven. I want you to rejoice today because if you are in Christ today, I want you to know that without a doubt, your names are written in heaven. You are sons and daughters of God, and you are sharing together with me in the inheritance of light. Think about that. That ought to grab you. That ought to change you. That ought to transform your thinking today. Yeah, let's give people what they want still. I want to grow. Okay? If you want to give people what they want, here's what our church will look like. It'll be characterized by three words. It will be false, number one. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, if you give people what they want, everything is going to be vain around here. It will be vapid. It will be empty because the only thing that goes out and returns accomplishing God's good purposes is His Word. And so, there are people out there today and they have these churches and they're delusive churches. They're churches that are filled with people who are trusting in works. They're trusting in their filthy works to get them to heaven. And they're, they're there every Sunday. I'm here every Sunday, Pastor, and I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm listening and I'm paying attention. I know the Bible and I can say all the books in order. I'm surely going to heaven. <laughs> you're not. If you're depending on that, you're going straight to hell. That's false. You say, but, well, surely I trust in Jesus, but I have to trust in, in, in the sacraments too, right? And I, I have to make sure that I'm doing certain things too. Jesus didn't do enough for me. Now be careful. What did you just say? Jesus, the Son of God, didn't do enough when he died on the cross for you? Do you see something wrong with that? I do. I lived a long time thinking that way, and I put that behind me. You don't do anything to earn your salvation because you are false and full of sin. Only Christ can save us. So there are all churches out there that have a false gospel, all different kinds of denominations. I could name a myriad of them. And included among them would be Baptist churches. They are false and full of sin. Do you know that there are Baptist churches out there? They don't worship God. Do you know who they worship? The pastor. You say, what do you mean? Yeah, there are churches out there. The pastor tells everybody what to do, even what color of car they should buy and where they should live and and uh, if the pastor moves, they should move with him. And All kinds of strange things going on in the world today. We need to worship God, not a man. Alright? False. 
If we want to give people what they want in this church, not only will we be characterized as false, we'll be characterized as nominal. Christian in name only, like the seven sons of Sceva. We Many people love to pro profess Christ, but they don't possess him. In other words, they don't have a real relationship with Christ at all. They think that they know Christ. They've done many wonders. They've prophesied. They cast out demons, so they speak, uh, think rather. But Jesus will tell them, I never knew you. The question will be different in that day. Who are you? The demon said, who are you? Jesus will say, who are you? I never knew you. You never knew me. I don't care what you said. It's what's right here. You say, but pastor, can you tell if I'm saved or lost? And the answer is no, I can't. I'm not God. But I know that God knows. You say, but can you get an idea generally of whether I'm saved or lost? Yes, I can see maybe fruit of the Holy Spirit at work in and through your life. But I can't know that for sure. Only God can. That's amazing. You say, what is the characteristic of a nominal Christian? Well, here it is. They practice lawlessness. And then they come to church on Sunday. But they still practice lawlessness. They don't practice righteousness. True children, are, true, true children are, of God are here on earth, earth rather, to demonstrate the righteousness of God openly. And when they do so, God is glorified. They are not glorified. That's the key. They're nominal. If we want to give people what they want, our church will also be characterized by the word self-righteous. Or, or maybe I could say self-confident. Many people are so bold and arrogant today. God resists people who are bold and arrogant and proud. He gives grace to the humble. Christians, even Christians themselves will be repelled by bold, arrogant, self-righteous people in the church. They won't want to be around you. I was talking to my sons about this the other day. If, if you're going to if you're going to have friends, how do you need to be? Well, you need to be friendly, Dad. And we were talking about a particular verse in the Bible. Well, then, it's all on you. If you come home and say to me, I don't have any friends, then you're not a friendly person. There's something wrong with you. I don't go to the school and say, Well, my kid doesn't have any friends. What's wrong with the school? Well, the, I'll tell you what's wrong. Your kid is wrong. Tell your child to come and be friendly. And they'll have friends. That's how it works. And so there are lots of self-righteous people around. They think that just because of who they are, they're something. I know Jesus. I know Paul. But who are you? Who are you? What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Don't return to the beggarly elements. Don't return to the law and live your life like that in a self-righteous, self-confident fashion. You're dead to the law and you're alive to Christ. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh and you'll do great and mighty things for God because he'll be at work in and through you. You say, well, many of the Ephesians here, they, they, they believed and they came confessing and telling their deeds. They did. And, and what was the result? They turned away from a, a love for the world, didn't they? They were willing to, to, to burn these books, but, but just don't be thinking about the books. Be thinking about what was once very precious in their lives they spent a lot of money on has now become something that is contemptible enough to burn that is genuine repentance that's a person who has turned turned to Christ and and not only that they turn away from the sin nature that's within them they get rid of the books. There's another reason that they get rid of them. Why did I get rid of my music? Why did I change my life the way that I did and put up safeguards? It's because I don't want to return to the evil that once was in my life. That's a good thing. I Do you want to make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof? 
And so when a brother comes to you and says, well, I, I just can't have the internet, brother, because it's just too much of a temptation to me. Don't, don't chasten him for that. Don't say to him something foolish like, well, when you get more spiritual like me, you'll be able to handle it. That is the most ignorant thing that you could ever say to a person. You ought to commend them. You ought to say, well, brother, that is wonderful because that is radical transformation. And, and yet we have people that do that. They, they say, oh, that, that person's off the, off the wall with their fanaticism. No, they're not. They love Christ more than they love the world. And they want to be protected. Don't, and by the way, don't be an occasion for sin for other people. You say, I have the liberty to do this. Well, you're causing your brother to stumble. If you have the liberty to do it, you have the liberty to not do it too. Don't be an occasion for your brother or your sister in Christ to stumble. Love them enough to let go of something that is just so stupid. We don't need all the things that we think we need. Genuine repentance, it produces something in us. I don't know a Christianity without shame or sorrow, do you? You say, but there shouldn't be ever shame and sorrow in our lives. I'm sorry, if you're sinning against the one who did so much for you, you're going to be ashamed and you're going to be filled with sorrow. But the Bible says that that will be a godly sorrow that produces genuine repentance. You'll turn away from that activity. You'll turn away from that thinking. And now, what you once so loved and adored, you will have an indignation toward. You will have a godly abhorrence for. Do you know that there were things that were once in my life that brought me a great deal of joy and excitement? But when I think about them now, I, I just shrink back in horror and fall to my knees and thank God that he delivered me from those things. Just because it brought me joy and excitement doesn't mean it's a good thing. You see, but you're, you're just so definite about this stuff. You're, you're just intolerant of other ways of thinking and other religions and people. Yes! Because the Bible is intolerant that way. We're living in a younger generation. They're afraid to even say that it's okay to judge a situation. Do you realize that? They're tripping all over themselves to be intolerant. Uh, or to be tolerant, rather. We've got to be tolerant. We've got we to accept everyone. We've got to accept everything. Accept everyone and everything. Believe nothing. Jesus was intolerant. You're not coming to Jesus through Islam. You're not coming to Jesus through the Baptist Church. You're not coming to Jesus through Catholicism. You're not coming to Jesus any other way, right, but the Bible way, through his death, burial, and resurrection. By the way, there are a lot of men that have lived, and they have preach the gospel. You think of Billy Graham. He preached the gospel and many people have gotten saved through his ministry, even some in this room. But Billy Graham became a Christ denier when, when he said that there were other ways of salvation, that Christ wasn't the only way and we shouldn't say that. He denied Christ. John Stott has written many wonderful books, but when he denied the reality of hell, he became a Bible denier. You see, but I like those men. But they should serve as a warning to us that we could change in a moment. We need godly indignation and godly abhorrence for sin. And if we don't have it, then maybe we have what we want, but we don't have what we need. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that you would teach us all that there needs to be good ministry in our lives. And good ministry comes only by following your example and only when we're infused with the gospel ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. The only thing that will make a difference in the lives of people today is your word empowered by your spirit to transform the lives of people you love. And so, Lord, I pray that you would do that. I ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen.